In the year 1066, Norman victory at the Battle of Hastings brought an end to the rule of the last Anglo-Saxon king, Harold Godwinson. But what were the roots of the Norman conquest? Why were the Normans so successful? And what was it like for the last Anglo-Saxon monarch, King Harold? Find out in today's episode of the History Chronicles. In 1052, King Edward the Confessor was in his weakest position yet. Since becoming king a decade earlier, he had been carefully managing the influence of the most powerful family in the land. Godwin, the Earl of Wessex, had initially supported the king's claim to the throne back in 1042, but had since challenged the king's authority. Tensions between the king and his leading earl had come to a head in 1051, when the death of the Archbishop of Canterbury had prompted a bitter power struggle. In medieval England, the Archbishop of Canterbury held immense spiritual significance, but also a great deal of secular power as a close ally of the king. In 1051, Godwin's candidate for the new archbishop, an Anglo-Saxon called Ethelric, had been overruled by King Edward. Instead, Edward had appointed one of his own French connections to the post, a man called Robert of Juniège. Friction erupted in a skirmish between Edward and Godwin's forces in the town of Dover. When the king demanded Godwin's submission, the Earl had refused and fled. He returned a year later, in 1052, having rallied his sons and an army which marched to London and defiantly brought Edward to heel. Edward's ally, Robert of Juniège, was removed and an Anglo-Saxon, Stigand, was put in his place. Stigand just happened to be Godwin's man. In 1052, Edward had been forced to make a humiliating U-turn on his approach to the Godwin family. His army had refused to fight for him after all, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle reports, they did not wish the country to be laid open to foreigners. In all likeliness, this referred to the risk of a Viking invasion at the time, but could well also refer to Edward's preference for French allies. He had lots of continental connections from his upbringing in Normandy. All in all, 1052 was a bad year for the king. What's more, the Godwin family were soon to leave an even greater mark in English history. In 1053, Earl Godwin, the father of the dynasty, died. His eldest son, Harold Godwinson, succeeded him as Earl of Wessex, taking control of the largest earldom in England. Two years later, in 1055, another of Harold's brothers, Tostig, was appointed as the Earl of Northumbria by the now cowed King Edward. In the space of just a few years, Harold and his family took control of most of England. His brothers, Gerth and Leofwine, were similarly given earldoms by the king and Harold himself extended his earldom to include that of Hereford upon the death of its earl in 1057. Further confidence was displayed by the Godwin family in just how they managed their territory. Harold was frequently absent from Wessex on campaign against the Welsh. These wars lasted on and off into the 1060s, leading to eventual triumph in 1063, when Harold's military victory managed to undermine the authority of the Welsh prince, Griffith ap Llywelyn. This was enough to incite a rebellion against the Welsh prince. Llewellyn's head was delivered to Harold as a trophy of his victory. Harold's brother Tostig was with him on this last campaign, and Tostig himself displayed confidence in making a two-year pilgrimage to Rome. This was particularly poignant given that Tostig ruled the earldom of Northumbria, a spot which had often been troublesome given its Danish heritage. From 1054 until 1066, Harold's authority in England appeared well established and secure. Crucially, the Earl did not act against the King. Rather, he acted as the King's subregulus, a Latin word meaning half King. It was usual for the chief Earl of the Kingdom to perform duties on behalf of the King, but Harold's proactivity in this role was particularly striking. He quelled the numerous rebellions that emerged in Wales for the King and, in 1065, even acted against his own brother Tostig, seemingly on the king's behalf. Tostig's rule in Northumbria had been cruel. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle writes that he had repressed the Northumbrian nobility through his misdeeds and the heavy yoke of his tax. As a result, the nobility in the north had rebelled, backing a rival candidate Morcar as the new earl. Morcar was presented to Harold, who, in a surprising but pragmatic gesture, accepted the new earl over his brother. Tostig was exiled, and Morcar was installed in the north. In this instance at least, Harold Godwinson, the Earl of Wessex, had put England's stability above that of his own family. Another surprising moment had taken place a year earlier in 1064. In this year, Harold Godwinson paid a visit to Normandy, seemingly on the King's behalf. 
Sailing from Bosham in Sussex, he met with a hostile reception when he arrived on the Norman coast. He was captured by a man called Guy of Ponthieu, a lesser nobleman in Normandy who seemingly thought ill of Harold's intentions. Soon after, however, he was freed by none other than the Duke of Normandy himself, a certain man called William. Harold and William then embarked on a military campaign together, subduing one of William's rebellious knights. They then returned to William's court in Rouen, where Harold received a friendly reception. What happened next, though, was to be a matter of dispute for historians ever since the 1060s. According to Norman sources, chief among them the elaborate Bayeux Tapestry, Harold swore an oath to William on two holy relics. The tapestry does not give us details as to what this oath entailed, but other Norman accounts relate that here Harold made the most significant of promises to Duke William. Harold promised him the English throne. Indeed, it seems that the time was ripe for such a declaration. King Edward was getting old and infirm. Throughout the 1050s and 1060s, he had remained more or less in London, completing his grand new project, the construction of Westminster Abbey. Edward had had no children from his wife Edith, the sister of Harold Godwinson. His medieval biography puts his childlessness down to his piety. Later historians have argued that he could well have been homosexual. In any case, his absence of sexual proclivities later gained him the epithet of confessor or holy one. In 1161, he was canonized and he remains a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. While he lived, he had spent some time in search of an heir, seeking out his distant relatives on the continent. However, this search bore little fruit. Only his distant cousin, a young boy called Edgar the Atheling, or child prince, was brought back to England as a potential successor to the king. But in 1064, Edgar was seemingly considered too young to be an effective ruler. Therefore, it appears likely that Edward sent his earl Harold to promise the throne to someone who would be a strong, effective leader in England when Edward died. Where better to look than in Normandy, the home of Edward's childhood? Whatever happened on Harold's visit in 1064, it was certainly used by the Normans to justify their Duke William of Normandy to lay claim to the English throne when Edward died. In January 1066, Edward breathed his last. He was buried in the great new church of Westminster Abbey, which he had almost, but not quite, seen to completion. Harold Godwinson, who was at Edward's deathbed, acted quickly. Within days, with the agreement of the King's Council, the Witan, Harold was crowned King. His reign was to be one of the shortest and most troubled in English history. Harold appeared paranoid from the start. He began his reign with the same proactivity that had marked out his days as sub-regulus under Edward. Quickly, he called out the third, the Anglo-Saxon army, in addition to a fleet that was, according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, larger than any king had assembled before him. These forces he mustered along the south coast. This gives us more evidence to suspect that Harold was indeed expecting problems to arise from Normandy, and that he had indeed pledged the throne to William back in 1064. Across the Channel, Harold's suspicions were to be proved right. William was mustering his own forces, he had summoned his barons to support him in an ambitious grand invasion of England. The Bayeux Tapestry shows us in detail how ships were already being prepared for this enterprise. Horses and armour were being gathered and carried aboard William's growing invasion fleet. But problems came twofold. Building a fleet took time, and as the months drew on, no invasion came. By September 1066, the third had been out too long. They could no longer be provisioned and, as was standard among fighting men of the Middle Ages, Ordinary soldiers had to return home to tend their crops and to gather in the harvest. The third dispersed on Harold's orders. But just as they did so, England faced a new invasion. This invasion came not from Normandy, as Harold had anticipated, but from Norway. The Norwegian king Harold Hardrada had a distant claim to the English throne through a pledge made by Hartha Knut, a Viking ruler of England who had died in 1042. For years, Harold Hardrada had tried to conquer and claim the throne of Denmark. However, this had met with failure and was perhaps one of the reasons as to why he now turned his attention towards England. A new opportunity had arisen in the exile of Harold Godwinson's brother Tostig, who had now sought an alliance with Harold Hardrada in a bid to reclaim his lost earldom of Northumbria. Together, the pair raided the coast of England in September 1066 and eventually landed to capture the city of York in the north. A fierce battle ensued as two Anglo-Saxon earls, Edwin and Morcar, rushed to York's defence. But 
These owls were defeated at Gate Fulford on September the 20th of that same year. Harold Godwinson, hearing of the news, recalled his army and rushed up to York. Godwinson's experience as a soldier and commander was on fine display in this quick rush to battle. Hardrada and Tostig's forces were taken completely by surprise and defeated in an ambush by Harold Godwinson at Stanford Bridge on September the 25th, 1066. Hardrada and Tostig were no more, they were killed in the battle. Harold Godwinson had triumphed. But the Annus Cerebilis of 1066 was not over quite yet, for just as Harold had defeated his enemies at Stanford Bridge, William of Normandy's forces sailed across the English Channel and landed at Pevensey on the south coast. Here they quickly strengthened the existing Roman fort and proceeded to ravage the surrounding countryside. It seems clear that William wanted to draw Harold Godwinson down to him and force the battle as soon as possible. It was already late in the year, and William had brought with him a large number of men that would prove to be difficult to provision over winter in a hostile country. Indeed, Harold had to respond, for William was laying waste to his own lands in the south. Once again, King Harold was forced into action. He marched south from York in great haste, covering almost 400 kilometres in the space of a week. On his way, he mustered yet another army. According to one chronicler, however, these were not his finest troops of the third, but the scrapings of the Shire, men who had been hastily drawn up at a time of desperation. William drew up his forces to meet King Harold at Hastings on the 14th of October 1066. The Anglo-Saxons positioned themselves high on Senlac Hill. Their style of fighting was a defensive one. They fought on foot and used their large shields to form a long and impenetrable wall. For generations such a tactic had worked against their Danish enemies from whom they had learned this strategy. In contrast, the Norman army used a combination of foot soldiers and cavalry. Norman noblemen were trained in the use of a horse on the battlefield, rushing at their enemies then stabbing at them with spears from their elevated position. At Hastings, these different tactics were to meet head on. The battle supposedly began around 9am. At first the Normans had difficulty. Repeated charges at the Anglo-Saxon shield wall failed to break it. The fighting was fierce. On one occasion it appears that William was thought dead amongst his men. Only when he removed his helmet and showed his face was confidence restored in his army. Then a contingent of his army formed from men of Brittany began to waver. Apparently the shield wall was just too strong. But with their strength, the Anglo-Saxons had grown overconfident on the battlefield. Giving up their high position on Senlac Hill, many Saxons broke their shield wall and charged the Bretons in an attempt to rout the defeated forces. Now the shield wall had cracked and Norman cavalry could use their superior mobility on the battlefield. William rallied his men, wheeled around and cut down the Anglo-Saxon charge in mid-flow. Quickly, the battle had turned. The Anglo-Saxon shield wall crumbled in the face of this disarray. King Harold and his brothers Gerth and Leofwine were now personally caught up in the melee. His brothers were soon killed in the fighting. As for Harold, one of the oldest sources about the battle tells us that he was hunted down by a Norman killing squad in mid-battle. He had fought a valiant fight, but on the afternoon of the 14th of October, 1066, King Harold was dead. The victorious William now travelled to London. Here he met with the surviving earls Edwin Morcar and the young Edgar Atheling. The young Anglo-Saxon prince held a distant claim to the throne, but now was only a teenager in no position to challenge the triumphant William. The earls submitted to the duke in what was now quite clearly a Norman conquest of England. On Christmas Day 1066, William the Conqueror, Duke of Normandy, was crowned King of England by the Archbishop of York in Westminster Abbey. As the ceremony took place, his guards stood vigilant outside of the church. Such was their anxiety that, when the Anglo-Saxon crowd shouted an acclamation for the king, they interpreted it as a riot and swiftly proceeded to massacre the crowd that had gathered there. This swift use of violence was to characterise the Norman conquest where William, using only a small number of loyal men, was to change England for good. Thank you for watching this episode of the History Chronicles. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe and click that notification button below. Check out our Patreon page as well, and I'll see you next time for a more history on the History Chronicles. Thank you.